I'd like to introduce the panel. First of all, we have um, to my left, Mary Cranston. Mary was the chair and chief executive officer of Pillsbury for eight years and currently serves on the boards of several public companies as well as the Stanford Children's Hospital. On a personal note, Mary shared that the universe has only chosen to grant her with grandsons, three of them. However, she solemnly promises to make sure that they get it. <laughs> Next to Mary is Mona. Mona is an entrepreneur, business executive, fierce diversity advocate, tenacious business partner, and seasoned attorney, and chipster extraordinaire. She currently leads the strategy and implementation of the Grace Hopper Celebration, the largest annual convention of women technologists in the world, and is the co-founder of a company called Viblio. And then finally, we have Caroline back to join us with the panel, so thank you. Before we dive into the substance of the panel, uh, we have the audience participation part, at least the first part, um, and we'd like to do three poll questions, so get out your mobile devices. Have you ever received feedback that you were too aggressive or too pushy? <laughs> Interesting. I'm shocked. 50-50. Um, OK, I think we're settling on in on stage. numbers. Good point. It's when you hit the certain level that you get it. OK. Um, so more than half of you have been told that. Um, I'm actually surprised that it's that low, uh, given this audience. <laughs> um, but it is amazing and sobering to think about how many of us have received that as feedback. Um, the second question for the panel is, have you ever decided not to pursue an opportunity because you have experienced bias or were afraid of experiencing bias? So it's roughly uh, landing on a 50-50. So I think that's a significant number um, who've been in that situation. So let's move on to our third and final poll question. Have you ever been asked to do the housekeeping chores for a meeting, for example, <laughs> taking notes or getting coffee? Unfortunately, it looks like the yeas have it by a wide yeah. margin. <laughs> um, so the purpose of asking you those questions is to get all of you thinking about what is unconscious bias and whether you personally have experienced it. So my ask is that as you listen to our panelists, start thinking about questions that you want to ask them as we'll try to leave a fair amount of time at the end of the panel to address those questions. So, let me start off by asking um, Mary, um, can you share an instance from your own career in which you felt like you experienced unconscious bias? You know, I actually think now that it's, it's just in the endemic culture, so it's, it's around all the time. And for me, as a, as a kind of an early mover, I'm kind of old now, uh, where there weren't very many women in the environment, it took me a while to even realize that there was an issue. We were kind of just happy to be in the workplace as females at all. Um, and I've spent the last 20 years on the Catalyst Board, so I've spent a lot of time in the research in this area, and it, it's all kind of come together for me now. But I remember um, when I was younger, working my way up through Pillsbury, and uh, I became a partner, and I was uh, really kind of thrilled that I was, I was a partner, you know? Um, and. Uh, Pretty quickly, though, I became, and I, I thought I would be happy for the rest of my life because I had made the, the grade, and that was true for about two weeks, and then I started thinking about, well, what's next? And um, that's when I began to realize that I was, um, I was a very good girl in Pillsbury. <laughs> I was uh, really appreciated for all the effort I would put in on the team. I was everybody's favorite second chair, and I was pretty bored, actually, and I looked around at the power people in the firm. I realized not only were they all male, but they all had great books of business and they were in control. And I, I started to really say to myself, well, how do I get there and why am I here? And I, I started to see that my aspirations had been unconsciously shaped to getting A's, being evaluated as a good girl in that environment. And that to get ahead, I had to be much more of a leader 
to step ahead of the people who were grading me, in a sense. And that's when I began to set goals for myself and um, to be a rainmaker and to be a leader. And, and the first thing that happened after I set the goal was I started to have all kinds of thoughts in my own head about how this wasn't possible and how it was actually kind of dangerous and I could get in trouble and blah, 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 blah. I didn't even know that stuff was in my psyche till I set a goal that was outside of my old paradigm. And uh, as I became uh, more involved in Catalyst and started to look at the research, these, cult these biases that Caroline was describing are endemic and they're carried by men and women. We both carry them, but we carry them differently. So in women, it's often self-doubt. And in men, it's an inability to really perceive accurately the competence of women. So it's, for us, a big issue, I think, is really overcoming and understanding our own self-doubts. And for me, that's been a lifelong mm -hmm. journey. So that was a real wake up at that point in my career where I realized that I had definitely suffered bias but a lot of it was because I had totally bought into the system too. I was gonna be a good girl and be part of the team. And from that point on, it, uh, you know, this, this whole new horizon opened up and I began to be able to accomplish things I never would have thought possible if I hadn't seen my own boundaries. Thank you, Mary. Mona, I know you have an interesting story to share as well. I have a story that I've never told in public before. So this is uh, breaking news for everybody. Um, and uh, unlike Mary's story, mine uh, happened really at the beginning of my career. So like many of you, I did an undergraduate degree in engineering. And uh, the summer before my senior year in engineering, I worked for a engineering consulting firm. And it was like a real up and coming firm. You could consider it a startup in engineering consulting. They had about 200 um, employees at the time. and. Uh, yeah, it wasn't the most exciting work in the world, but you know, what first job is. Um, so I guess I was doing pretty well there during the course of the summer. And uh, I got to work on a project, a very high visibility project with the president. And I must have done pretty well. He seemed to like me. Um, and then he asked me into his office one day and <laughs> he said, um, you know, I was wondering if you'd be available Saturday night to babysit my children. <laughs> and the thing is, this guy was a really good guy. I mean, he's really smart and he, I mean, just a really wonderful person and a really excellent engineer and, and leader and, and president and executive. Um, you know, but I was the only engineer who was a woman in this organization. Everybody else who's a woman was not an engineer and he wanted me to babysit his children. And I was um, young and immature and not smart enough to have any response other than, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and so I showed up at his house Saturday night and <laughs> I met his wife and I met his children and I babysat and he paid me. And then the next morning on Monday I went to work and I did engineering. Um, and then he asked me again. In fact, once, I, I, so I babysat his children a couple of times. I'm embarrassed to say this in public in front of like 450 women. That's how dumb I was back then. But the thing is, you know, this lack of confidence. I, I had no confidence to say anything other than okay. Um, there was one night where I actually babysit, had babysat his children overnight. So I slept in his house. I slept in the president's house. It was just weird. Anyway, did really well, went back to school, went, you know, did my last year of engineering. They called me up in December and said, we loved your work, do you want to come back? And I said no. And the thing about it is, at that time, I couldn't have told you why I said no. I just didn't like it. I didn't like it. And so, um, I, I didn't, I left, I left technology. I went and got, got, got a law degree and went into another profession that has a whole bunch of bias around it, so I'm not sure that I did myself <laughs> any favors. Um, but, and, and, the, and the thing that's really sad when I look retrospectively on it is that this organization, this um, engineering consulting firm, ended up being a massive success. Mm -hmm. So they were doing really well, they grew to like over a thousand um, consultants and I did not participate in that success even though I did really well there. And it's because I felt uncomfortable. I felt really uncomfortable because of what this really well-meaning man did to me. And I, didn't, I couldn't have identified at the time that this was bias. I, just, I, did, I knew I didn't want to be there. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
So moving on to some of those practical strategies, um, Mary, I know you have a framework that you share with others about um, how to deal with situations when you're experiencing unconscious bias. Yeah, you know, um, Catalyst came out with a study a couple of years ago. It really captured me. The, the quintessential way to think about the, the, cult the uh, male-female bias in the workplace is the stereotype is that men take charge and women take care. So we are naturally assumed. That's kind of the default stereotype. And if you want to be seen as a leader and you're female, you have to do a little more, as Carolyn was saying. Um, and uh, McKinsey also undertook a very long study where they interviewed virtually every woman CEO in the United States, and then women like me who led big professional services firms, women who were the head of their government in other countries, couldn't do it in the US because we haven't had that yet, and um, women who led major universities. So, and the question of these women was, how did you get to the top of a male-dominated field? And uh, these women gave long interviews, were very honest about looking back on their career, what was it you know, that allowed them to kind of break through the mold? McKinsey, in writing their book, decided not to go into, cult, into the uh, stereotypes themselves because they felt at that time that communicating around it was kind of complicated. Mm. But these, um, if you know a lot about stereotyping and you hear these patterns that emerge from the interviews with these women, you know, kind of the hair stands up on the back of your head because it is absolutely the best ways of trumping the, the cultural bias. And one of the things that was important for me to understand is that the cultural biases are unconscious. They are not malicious. People don't even know they're doing it. And in my own experience, as I, uh, I, when I read the McKinsey study, I realized I had basically figured all this out, and that's how I kind of did it myself. So I can, I can attest that these are very helpful things. And my experience with them is that as you master these five things, cultural bias kind of melts around you. You just don't notice it as much. I can certainly go into an environment where people don't know me and I have to work a little bit to be seen, but um, I think these are really, really helpful five areas. So they are, generally women need to find something that they're really passionate about, that they can find an intrinsic sense of meaning. And when you understand cultural bias, you can see why that's the case. I mean, if you didn't really care about it, why would you put up with all the crap from the, the cultural bias? <laughs> Second thing is energizing. This one was probably the biggest eye-opener for me. Um, you know, we all, especially as women, we multitask to beat the band and we carry a lot of things, particularly shoulds from the family. You gotta do the Christmas cards, you gotta do the, you know, the holiday entertaining and blah, blah, blah. And um, the, the, the most successful women have figured out that you can't uh, do it all, but you really need to ruthlessly prioritize. And what they do is consciously deal off the bottom the stuff they least like to do. And so you have to actually ask your own body, how do I feel about unloading the dishwasher compared to some other task? It, it gets that simple. And you <laughs> just get rid of all the stuff that for you, and it's an idiosyncratic decision, for you, the stuff that drags your energy down the most. You can't get rid of all of it, but if you unload the bottom stuff, you'll find that your whole level of energy to do things goes up. Third thing is to learn to reframe. Because of the culture, you know, the, the culture that we grew up in, we tend to have a lot more self-doubt. As I said, when I started to push the edge of what I thought was possible and set really big goals for myself, it was these fears that came up, and they were in my own head. And so I had to actually deal with them. I had to use a lot of energy. What all of these women talk about is learning the skill of reframing, kind of becoming conscious of the way they think about um, incidents or, or experiences that are less than positive. You know, do you let it start you on that vicious cycle downward of all your self-doubts, or can you kind of intervene and start looking at it cognitively? Is there another explanation here? You know, um, what else could I do here? One of the techniques that McKinsey uses a lot with women to sort of demonstrate this is a, uh, they give a hypothetical where there's a, um, a board meeting and you're giving a presentation, all of a sudden the CEO walks out. And the question is, what do you think is going on? And you'd be amazed. I mean, some people think that the CEO just thinks they're full of shit and left. Some people think he had to go to the bathroom. Some people think he's <laughs> hurt enough and he's all on your side. It's a Rorschach of your inner psyche in response <laughs> to an ambiguous situation. So reframing is all about really doing um, 
an analysis of the way you react to negative situations and becoming more uh, resilient. The third thing is um, learning to network like a guy. It's no, the research is very clear that men naturally are conditioned to have uh, extensive networks that are essentially quid pro quo. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Women are more inclined to have deeper friendships. And, and how many of you have had this experience where you, you don't really want to trade on your friendship with a woman because it's, <laughs> you know, it's so important? We have got to get over that. And all of the successful pioneer women uh, figured that out. So it's, it's a much broader uh, group of people that you have kind of a, a simpler relationship with. And then the last thing, probably the most important, is speaking up and taking risk. There's no question in a gender biased world that women pay a bigger price for saying something stupid than a guy, and that um, in some ways almost everything you do has higher risk. Unfortunately, you have no choice if you want to get out of the box but to learn to speak up more because it is by communicating that you overcome the bias that you are a caregiver. It's only by letting people know that you have ambition, that what you want to do. There's a lot of techniques for learning how to toot your own horn that does not elicit backlash. But women have to learn that skill set because if they don't, they will have this backlash. Um, and then taking risks. This is one of the most interesting pieces of the puzzle. Taking risks actually is the thing that women can do that most correlates with happiness. Now that seems a little counterintuitive when you just think of a risk and your mind starts throwing up all the, the problems with it. But if you think about it, if you have an intuitive hit that you want to do something, that you're moving in that direction, has meaning for you, and then you do a pro and con, which is basically letting your unconscious internal biases evaluate the situation and tell you how risky it is, and then you don't do it, you know, you're voting against yourself time after time, and it's quite depressing. And I think, honestly, if you look back in your life and think about a big risk that you took, it may not have turned out exactly as you expected, but you can see why that opened huge doorways for you. So those are the five patterns. And in my own life, it was absolutely the case that um, I had to kind of figure them out. And the one tip I'll leave you with in terms of setting a goal for yourself that is outside of what you think is possible, that means you probably have no idea how to get there. And my first big goal was to become the top rainmaker in my law firm. I had no idea how to do it. There were, I'd never seen a woman rainmaker. And all I could tell with using my gut was whether a little baby step would move me closer to the goal or farther away. And for five years on a very disciplined basis every day, I would take little baby steps. I could tell if a baby step would move me in that direction or not. And I just did that. And it was the repeated effort the, um, and that allowed me, the fears kept coming up, but that allowed me to kind of pat them on the head and go for it anyway. The baby steps were going for it. And, you know, in five years, it all happened. So, and I don't think I got special skills. I think it was honestly the very disciplined focus on setting a goal outside of the realm of possibility and then just sticking with it. So that's what I would say. Thank you for sharing those words of wisdom. <laughs> Caroline, uh, I'm sure that in the course of your research and in talking to many companies, you've also developed um, some strategies or tools that you could share with our audience. Sure. Um, so I think I want to echo uh, what Mary talked about in terms of your own personal vision and mission. Uh, one of the things the research shows the most important long-term predictor of success is to have growth mindset, right? And so. This is a term coined by Carol Dweck, which is, are you able to have kind of a long-term vision of your leadership purpose and experience the failures and the negative feedback you're gonna get because of bias as part of your learning journey that really can propel you forward? Often, because women get this negative feedback about communication style or how you carry yourself, you're not confident enough, you're too confident it's really easy to kind of become overly focused on how we're perceived and kind of get paralyzed in the process, right? And so if you can just focus on articulating what's your long-term goal, and then it really frees you to use all of the tools at your disposals um, to move forward. The other thing um, that research has shown is a really effective tool actually resides in this room, which is 
because women who toot their own horns sometimes are, are not liked, it turns out that one of the best things you can do for each other is to toot somebody else's horn for them, right? And, or think about how somebody will introduce you in the courtroom or in a meeting. What research shows is that when somebody else introduces the person for their skills and expertise and confidence, that just is enough to remove some of the unconscious biases of the person and the person can really experience the person's talent. So they did an experiment where they introduced a woman professor as this is Lisa, she's the professor. The other condition is this is Lisa, she's an expert in this field, she's published 10 papers and she will be your professor. And so the teaching evaluations are drastically different. Same teaching, right? But even if you can't say, hey, I'm smart and I'm the professor and I have 10 papers because people will be like, oh, she's kind of you know, abrasive, I don't like her. But you can make sure that you're introduced for your expertise at every turn and form kind of a posse with each other to position each other um, in different situations. It's very easy and very powerful. Maybe I should just throw in right here the, the main tip I have for how to toot your own horn when you don't have you're in a situation where there's all men in the room and you don't have a, a natural ally to introduce you. And that is to um, make declarative points um, that are supported by a story from your past that adds a new element into the, into the meeting. You know, it's actually very, it's a helpful story, but it shows that you have that skill set. So you're not saying, I am the world's greatest cost cutter in a, in a meeting where they might be talking about how to turn around a company. This is kind of a simple-minded example, but you could say, you know, that, that's a very good point you just made, and one experience that I had that was illuminating is that if we went at it very quickly and, uh, and took out the, uh, you know, 40% of the back office overnight, it reduced the tension and the drag in the organization from the, from the, the game plan. So something like that will say in the room that you have this experience, but you're not, um, you know, putting yourself forward as, as anybody special, you just have the experience. Mm -hmm. right. So, Mona, there are um, several different situations where unconscious bias can manifest itself. Um, what are the different types of strategies that can be used in each of those different situations? I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm di I've been dying to get to this <laughs> question, Nirma. <laughs> And let me tell you why, by way of background. So I've actually spent over a decade um, building up women's programs to talk about how women should you know, act and respond and stuff like that. And I had this sort of crisis of confidence last year, I was telling the team about this on the phone call, where I just, I, I just broke down, I said, I've been doing it all wrong for a decade. And there's still room for that. There's still, and you've heard a lot of advice on this panel and on other panels on how we should address things. But I call this sort of what I call preaching to the plaintiff, right? We're the plaintiffs because we suffer bias and, and we are being preached to about how we should handle that. And I had this crisis of confidence last year and I decided I'm going to stop doing that. So I, I want other people to continue doing that, but I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm going to preach to what I call the decision makers. And so you guys are plaintiffs in this room, but the majority of you are also decision makers in this room. And so, before I answer your question, <laughs> I want to talk about how bias manifests in decisions, like hiring decisions, and performance decisions, and promotion decisions. Um, because, you know, I think it's sort of a fun, it's a fun case scenario to go through. So let's take, for example, um, a particular bias that happens in hiring. So there's different kinds of biases, right? Um, we haven't talked about that too much today, but there are different kinds of biases. So in hiring, there's a kind of bias called an in-group in bias. Mm -hmm. And what kind? everybody understands what that is. We've talked about it a lot. And it basically says that, hey, if you're a lot like me, then I think that you have superpowers like me. Um, and so how does this manifest itself? It manifests itself. I'm going to be overly stereotypical here, so um, I hope you'll uh, forgive me. But you know, I'm a guy, I'm hiring, and Jim's for, let's say, a sales position, and Jim's applying, and Jim's like me. He went to Stanford, he golfs, I golf. Therefore, he's like me. He must be great at sales, so let's hire him for the sales position. That's in-group bias 
in a hiring scenario, right? Well, then you get to performance reviews. And there's a number of different biases that can be expressed in the context of performance reviews, but let's look at one of them, which is called confirmation bias, and you guys have probably all heard about that also. And confirmation bias basically says that, um, you know, you only pay attention to evidence that confirms what you already believe. And here's the thing, society teaches us all, you know, Carolyn, you said this in your opening remarks, it teaches us all to believe that leadership is a masculine, prototypically masculine trait. So even women and minorities will believe that uh, you're more of a leader if you're a white man, right? That's confirmation bias. So how does this um, it manifest itself with Jim? So Jim just got hired because he's like me, and now I'm getting ready to review Jim, and you know, there's been a complaint from a customer about Jim, and I say to myself, well, you know what? That's just a crazy customer, because that evidence does not confirm my belief, which is that Jim's a great person and also a superhero. And so now <laughs> I've given Jim a great performance review. Boom, right? All right, so now we move on to the next step. And you can see a different kind of bias when you're looking at promotions. So there's a bias called the halo bias or the halo effect. And you might not recognize the name of it, but we've all seen this happen, right? So the halo effect is, oh my God, you're awesome at this. You must be awesome at everything. And it generally only applies to men. Um, and so uh, the, the next step in the process is, okay, so Jim, I have told you all, I've proven that Jim is a fantastic salesperson because we ignore the evidence that he's not. And by the way, he's like me. And so um, I think he'd be great running head of sales for the entire company. <laughs> Right? That's the halo effect. And suddenly Jim, who might not have even merited getting the job, is now the head of sales because of a series of biases that affect hiring and performance and promotion. And the problem in my mind is not to tell us to do something different. The problem is to figure out how the decision makers stop inserting their bias into those key decisions. And how do we do that? Well, you know, it's sort of obvious, and people do talk about it. Um, you get a broad swath of feedback from a broad cross-section of diverse people with diverse views. And by doing that, you sort of, you know, ameliorate the bias that you're bringing to the table. And why don't we do that? Well, we don't do that because it takes a lot of time, and we're running at a million miles an hour, right? And so everybody knows that we should take some time and get a diverse pool of candidates to hire from. But we don't necessarily do that. And everybody knows we should do a massive 360 before we do performance reviews. But 360s are such a drag and everybody hates doing them, right? So everybody knows these things in the same way that we know we should exercise every day, um, and yet we don't, right? Um, and so, uh, the thing that, if I was gonna give, leave you guys with one big takeaway, from this is that we are all um, leaders in IP, except for me now. I'm not a leader in IP anymore, but I still get to sit up on the stage, thank you very much. Um, but we're all leaders in IP. We are all uh, believers in innovation, and we are all advocates of diversity. And there are a lot of new technologies out there that make the process of getting diverse feedback much easier. But we're not spending the time looking for them and as decision makers, we're not spending the time advocating to implement them and to enforce them within our organizations. If there's a single scalable thing I think we can do to address your question, because I'm finally answering your question, <laughs> is, is to actually start looking at technology to scalably help us um, address the bias problem. And I think if I can build on your point, uh, it's, it's also really focusing on criteria Often, you know, it's Jim does this, Jim this is great at this, therefore, but there's no conversation around what are the criteria we're evaluating these people on? And the simple fact of defining criteria as a group, as a hiring group, or as evaluators before you start looking at people dramatically reduces the probability of bias being inserted. But then you start noticing how criteria are not well defined or how they shift in the process. So really looking at criteria and can we evaluate people against 
consistent criteria is a great equalizer. In our example at Stanford, as our faculty advisor sits on the hiring committees for new faculty, and whenever teaching evaluations are mentioned, for example, she just elevates the conversation. She doesn't say, oh, well, here you are, biased, right? She says, wait a minute, is teaching evaluations one of our criteria? Because if it is, we need to review all the other resumes we already talked about and apply that criteria consistently, right? So she often serves as kind of a criteria monitor. And it's not, it's not defensive, it just elevates the conversation and everybody can agree that they want to evaluate people fairly against a criteria. Let me leave in here too because I jump on this point because I think Catalyst has actually concluded that this is the heart of the glass ceiling, that women's potential is just not evaluated in the same way and that most of the measurement devices out there are very flawed. Exactly. Even a question like rate this person's potential is a completely biased question yeah. after what you've heard. Um, but but as, as, as you both of you, the point both of you made, the, uh, uh, a guy who does a great leadership job because men take charge is gonna automatically be presumed to be good at each leadership job. Whereas a woman who does a great leadership job in a particular area will be seen as a very gifted idiot savant. Really good at that thing, <laughs> but has no stretch potential. And, and sitting on boards, I see this all the time. That's one of the reasons why women need to get on boards uh, because um, our view of the pipeline is, is very different. But, and, and I have great sympathy with your Crisis. desire to fix the problem as opposed to fixing us. But um, I also uh, have had this desire my whole life. I've been working for 45 years now and it's a lot better, but it's not fixed yet. So I would say the one thing, to go back to what I was saying earlier um, about communication, if the bias is there, the, the default stereotype is that you'll be really good at what you've already proven you can do, but not seen accurately in terms of your potential to do something else. And the way to, the best way I have found to um, address that within your organization is find sponsors, uh, men or women who have the ability to help you navigate your career. Uh, make sure you communicate very clearly what you want to do and why you're the best candidate in the company to do it. And because women are so under-evaluated for this thing, if you can put together a good cogent elevator pitch on why you would be the right person, it tends to be accepted. It's just that because of the unconscious bias, nobody else is going to do it for you. So it requires a lot more effort to um, get these things accomplished. And uh, so I think uh, you don't have to take it, but you do have to be smart about how you, how you get your next steps aligned for yourself. Great. Um, Mona, I'm sure you have an opinion on this one. Um, what are some strategies that have not worked for organizations to address the issue of unconscious bias? It turns out I have an opinion on that. <laughs> um, and, and, and this too is another controversial opinion, so I'll, I'll be the controversial person on the panel today. Um, so, you know, the thing is that, uh, so I don't believe that uh, bias training is, is necessarily the be all and end all of it, which isn't to say that unconscious bias training isn't valuable, because education is valuable. Um, but it turns out that while there's been this, you know, incredible amount of research to talk about the fact that bias does exist and the different ways, as we've talked about, about bias, how bias exists, there's actually very little research that proves that unconscious bias training um, has an effect to de-bias. Um, but we, this is what our solution is today. We spend all of our money and time training, which is great from an educational perspective. But as I said earlier, let's not confuse education with change. We all understand we should exercise more. We've been educated. That doesn't necessarily mean we change our habits, right? Absolutely. And so, um, in fact, I, after preparing for this, I, I said I was going to go out and I, and I was looking for a couple of research studies that I'd um, ran across earlier, and there is this one research study by um, a professor from Yale University who did an entire yeah. sort of, she looked at the entire history of diversity training and anti-stereotype training to try and see if anybody had identified a correlation between training and effect and determined that there wasn't any research that was definitive on the purpose except for one that she thought was well organized enough and it was some research done on anti-stereotype training in the military, and they determined that 
uh, right after, within a couple of months after, they saw a decrease in stereotyping, but then at three months, um, it just went back to normal again. So it's very much like the New Year's resolution, right? You go to the gym for January, and by March, you're sitting on your couch eating cake again. That's what she found. Yeah, I, I really, I want to echo that point, because it's all about how training in and of itself doesn't lead to change. Training as a mechanism that's built in a clear accountability structure with clear metrics and actions for success can be an accelerating tool, right? But um, there's been research showing that if all you do is say to people they're biased, you're actually increasing their biases. That's what I, I said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's a waste of money, right? So if you just say, yay, we're biased, people actually do worse than on the bias tax. They do work, so that's not a good investment whatsoever. If the message is bias exists and we all have collective accountability and responsibility as a firm to fix it where it shows up, then it can help. So it can only, it helps if it opens the door for really targeted accountability and intervention where people will feel a sense of ownership for change. You know, some of the most successful um, experiments have been where uh, large companies, mostly with male CEOs, try to get more women up in their upper ranks and they're not successful. So they're, they're frustrated and they get together and they sort of challenge each other mm -hmm. to um, bring more women up or to put more women on their boards. And they get into the sport of bringing in more women. And that seems to be slightly <laughs> more successful or, or acceptable than quotas, which I'm kind of in favor of if we don't get there any other way. Like and uh, uh, what that really is, is it's sponsorship from the very top. And that can move the needle fairly yeah. quickly. Yeah. And um, I'm seeing on, the Catalyst board is mostly made up of Fortune 100 CEOs, so most of them are men. But I, over the last 15 years, I've seen a big uh, change in the uh, awareness of these top CEOs in terms of the uh, how entrenched this problem is and how difficult it is to shift and they've all tried bias training and nothing's moved the needle and so they're now um, getting into this competition game but they're also in some of their companies putting in sponsorship programs where their senior executives uh, have um, accountability for the entire succession plan and it's tied in to their compensation as one of their key goals and that seems actually to be fairly effective. Now, many yeah. companies aren't willing to do that. Money but where mouth is. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. Somebody told me you need to go after the head, the heart, and the wallet. Yeah. If you're missing the wallet, yeah. change doesn't yeah. happen. So <laughs> I actually have several more questions, but I want to make sure that we have time to take questions from the audience. So what's, uh, what's on your mind? What would you like to hear from the uh, panelists on? Yeah, it's a very good question. I certainly think that, uh, let's start with what inside counsel can do. I think um, by using uh, gender uh, blind criteria yourself for the hiring of your outside lawyers, including you know, kind of putting pressure on firms to come up with balanced slates and that sort of thing, that can make a big difference. Um, and I think that uh, credentialing the great women lawyers that you know out there with other general counsel is probably the best way to do business development uh, extension for women. At least that's where I got most of my big breaks. Uh, going the other way, I think that um, some of the outside lawyers are actually, women lawyers are actually very active in um, you know, uh, various trade associations and industries and stuff and can actually, and may know CEOs of their clients and if they pay attention to uh, what's going on in the boardroom or the executive suite, may be able to uh, recommend general counsel for a lateral move or a board position. Uh, and again, it's an outside sponsor credential kind of communication. So I think if we all as women realize that um, we have so much trouble communicating our own talents, but that an outside endorsement is so powerful, and if we just kind of made it our business to uh, do a bunch more of that every week. It would be an amazing uptick in how many women are being seen for opportunities. And I think that could be one thing that you could do. I might add one thing um, from an organizational perspective because that's where I take a look at this. I think 
Out, it would be wonderful. I would love to see outside counsel lead by example. So, you know, the best way to get rid of um, a virus or a problem is to shine a light on it. And, and you heard Mellon talk about this morning that when we look for sponsors, we look for people who are willing to disclose their diversity numbers. So I would, I would encourage all outside counsel here, everybody, to, you are the decision makers, go back to your organizations, ask for transparency on your diversity numbers. Um, if outside counsel led the way on that, then inside legal counsel would be hard pressed not to follow. And I think that that would make a huge difference as far as taking that first step, shining transparency, shining a light on this. Good. Other questions from the audience? This one over here. There's uh, in the back corner over there. I think a, a microphone's coming your way. Hi. So in the babysitting example, if you had been at the time aware that what he was saying was biased in a particular way, um, at, the, at the time that it was happening, what would your response have been? Or what would you recommend to someone? If I had been mature, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would like to think that with maturity, I would be able to handle that situation by going up to him and saying, you know, um, it, it basically, as, as I'm saying right now, shining a light on the situation. Um, I, he, this person was not the type of person that I don't think couldn't have been educated, right? And so just being able to sit there and say, you know, you asked me to do this, I don't think you'd ask a man to do this. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, I think that this is a great organization, it's going places, and I wanna be on that trajectory to go places, but I need to feel comfortable to be here. Um, I'd love to help you find a babysitter. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just not me. You know, and let me generalize on that a little bit, because I think, um, Part of the problem is most of us do have good girl stuff. You know, it, we, we feel most comfortable when everybody around us is telling us we're doing well and we're, we're helping in every way we can. Um, and uh, in law firms and in, in uh, legal departments, uh, oftentimes that leaves us saying yes to things that don't really fit with our strategic goals for ourselves. So you start with the goals and then you figure out what you have to do to accomplish those goals and those become your first priority. And then the question is, what do you do with everything else? Um, and I think, uh, when was the last time you guys had a lot of free time? Probably kindergarten. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always a question of what you say yes to and what you say no to. And I call it the strategic no. So if somebody comes up and asks, uh, if you're in a law firm, comes up and asks you to take care of the summer program, you have to look deeply and say, does that line up with anything I'm actually trying to accomplish for myself? The answer to that is no then you have to tactfully say no to that. You know, I would never just say, no, I'm not gonna do it because it doesn't fit my goals. I would say something like, you know, that's it's such an important task. I'm worried that I'm not gonna have the bandwidth because I'm working on the most important client for the firm right now and they're, they're doing a lot of big deals. So that you're, you know, you're tactful about it, but you're very, very conscious all the time about what you're not gonna do. And um, that for me was probably the biggest, in, you know, action item that came out of this insight that you know, I, I needed to set my goals and go for it, is what I had to clear out. And like most of you, I mean, I was running the summer program and I was doing, you know, running marketing. And I, mean, I just had all this other garbage that um, everybody in the firm was telling me what a great person I was to do that and how good, I, good a job I was doing. It made absolutely no difference whatsoever to my career development or my compensation. I've heard a successful woman, great example, say, well, you know, I've done X, service work, I would, I would love to offer this great opportunity to some of my colleagues, right? And so make it as an opportunity that others should have access to and reframe it, not as, oh my God, you're asking me to do the office housework again, but say, you know, let's, let's consider how this work is distributed so that everybody can benefit from this great experience for their career. So I know there's a lot more burning questions in the audience. Um, I hope that we'll be able to continue this discussion during cocktails this evening. Um, so I know that um, I think Mary has to leave, but Mona and Caroline will be around. Um, so feel free to uh, continue the conversation this evening. I'll be here for cocktails. I just oh, okay. have to disappear Sorry. right now. <laughs> Great, thank you to our panel.